The evening here, we're here to enjoy ourselves and hear these, the wonderful story of four um, Division Three athletes, uh, two alums, and two current students. Uh, they have exciting stories themselves. Um, and to talk about what Division Three is and what it, what it allows us to do and what it entitles us to do and what are some of the responsibilities. Uh, but mainly, the panel is about hearing their stories and, and uh, celebrating that and celebrating Division III uh, as, a, as a division, but also celebrating Otterbein as we move into uh, homecoming, um, which is this weekend. Uh, exciting, exciting, exciting times at, at Otterbein. I just heard Adam a second ago talking about the last uh, soccer game at, at the uh, grass field. That will be a sad, sad, sad moment for me because I have watched some hugely wonderful, important, dramatic, exciting uh, games there. Um, but I'm also excited about our future uh, and the, uh, the soccer games that will come, the lacrosse games that will come, and the football games that will come in the new state. Really exciting times. And if there's any, there's many people to thank for that, especially the donors who made that possible, but also. Uh, our athletic director, Don Stewart, uh, really made that happen over the last couple of years. And if you don't know her, you should get to know Don uh, very quickly. She's a good person. Uh, let me introduce um, Adam Prescott. Adam is, is my go-to guy for many, many, many things. He is one of the smartest guys I know. He's a great, great, great writer. Not only is he a great writer, the other thing I uh, really respect about it is a great writer who is also fast. I can't believe how much good writing Adam does in a 24-hour cycle. I mean, it's story after story after story. Uh, the only regret I have about uh, Adam is that he was trained up north at Mount Union. Uh, he's a Mount Union grad, a Mount Union basketball player, but he certainly gives his heart and soul to, to Otterbein. And he and I have worked together on a couple of time class projects before, but this is, I think, the most exciting. He put this whole panel together. He got in touch with uh, the four uh, people that we see here, and they, they really do have exciting, dramatic, different stories. So, Adam. It's all mine. Yep. Well, thanks, everyone, for, for coming. Um, yeah, I've got four really, really good athletes here that uh, are going to share their stories. Um, Madison chose uh, Division Three over Division One school. Uh, the other three up here uh, went to a Division One school first and, and then came to Otterbein. Um, on the far end is Sean Kettering. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Sean, he's a two-time first-team all-conference shortstop for our baseball team. Uh, he's an all-region player. Uh, he led the conference in RBIs as a sophomore. He holds our school record for, for most doubles in a season with 20. Um, the cool thing about Sean, he got to play in the Great Lakes Summer Collegiate uh, Baseball League this past summer with mostly Division I players. Uh, he was voted to play in the All-Star game in that league and then ended up taking home MVP honors in the league. Um, we were talking a little bit before, uh, he's, he was currently the 17th rated prospect out of that league uh, as far as Major League Baseball scouts are concerned. Um, and with a good senior season here, uh, we'll see what happens, but uh, we've all got our fingers crossed that uh, he's going to continue playing after Otterbein. Uh, next to him is Kristen Bennett. Uh, Kristen graduated, I guess we can say 2013, in, in the, she graduated in three and a half years actually, um, so in the winter of 2012. Uh, she was an All-American outside hitter for our, our volleyball team. Uh, she helped us win the first and only uh, conference championship in our volleyball program's history in 2011. She actually buried home the final point, I think, in the tournament championship match. Um, she was also a national qualifier in track and field uh, in the long jump and the triple jump. She holds conference records in those, um, I think, a ridiculous leap of like 20 feet. <laughs> Almost. 19, feet. 8 and a 4, something like that. <laughs> exactly. Um, <laughs> she's also a three-time academic All-American. Uh, she's only the second three-time academic All-American in school history. Uh, coupled with one of our former men's golfers, and she's the only athlete to ever do it in two different sports. She got it twice in, in volleyball, once in, in track and field. Um, next to her is Madison Birchfield. Uh, Madison's a sophomore forward on our women's soccer team right now. Uh, she had a really good freshman season. Uh, she was second team all-conference, uh, five goals and four assists. Um, we had our first annual Cardi Awards this past year, uh, which kind of the SB Awards of Otterbein. Uh, Madison took home the award for best play. She had a had her in double overtime to beat Mount Union that kept us alive at the time for the conference championship. Uh, unfortunately, Madison went down with a preseason injury this year, just two days into camp. Um, we thought it was season ending, but it's not, so uh, we're expecting her back sometime during the next week or two. Uh, we're really excited about that added boost. 
Um, closest to me is uh, the man, that's Jack Rafferty. Um, our football team has only been to the NCAA playoffs one time ever, it was in 2008. Uh, Jack was a quarterback of that team. Uh, we went nine and two that year. Uh, we reached as high as number seven in the national rankings. Um, Jack accounted for over 2,000 yards of total offense that year. I, try, I like to say it was kind of a Johnny Manziel type of year that he had. Um, he scored 29 touchdowns, he only threw five interceptions that year. Uh, he was 15th nationally in, in passing efficiency. Um, and he was a finalist for the Gallardi Trophy, which is uh, recognized as the top football player in Division III, basically the highest in the trophy of Division III. Um, he threw for almost 4,000 career yards here, uh, won 16 games in just two years as a starter after he transferred in. Uh, so he has, a, he has a really great story to tell as well. So what I want from you guys right now is just, and whoever would like to start, I guess just talk us a little bit about your background, high school recruiting process, what schools you were looking at or what schools were after you, um, why you initially went there, um, and then I guess we'll get to why Otterbein after that. So maybe Jack, if you want to start. Sure. That was about 10 different questions. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I grew up in Columbus. Um, I graduated from Dublin Kaufman. I originally went to Western Kentucky. Uh, my dad had actually uh, coached at Western Kentucky maybe 25 years ago um, prior to me looking at colleges. So um, I had a little bit of a history with knowing some people down there. They offered me a full scholarship. So I went down there and played in two seasons um, and just had a bad experience there. Um, and then actually spent, stopped playing football after two seasons there, went to Kentucky for a year. Um, that's where my then girlfriend and now wife was playing soccer. We'd known each other from high school. So I went there for a year. And um, then after that, um, got a little bored, wanted to go back and finish my career. So I reached out to a few OCC schools that had recruited me out of high school. And um, I knew Coach Loth from the recruiting process. Coach Loth is, is not here anymore. Um, and uh, I chose to come back to, uh, to Otterbein to finish out my career. Had a great time. Um, got my master's degree actually while I was playing, which is one reason why I chose Otterbein because I knew they had an MBA program here, um, something that I would look at if I was all of you, and um, that's kind of how I got here. So, that's good for you. <laughs> I am from Troy, Ohio, north of Dayton. Um, I was recruited by OU, UC, and Moorhead State. Um, I got a scholarship from Moorhead but um, I chose not to go to D1 and came to Otterbein and I'm here. <laughs> All right, um, I am from Wadsworth, Ohio, so I went to Wadsworth High School. Um, in high school, I did volleyball, basketball, and track. And of those three, track is probably the very last one that I would have ever imagined playing after high school. But um, I actually ended up getting a track scholarship to Xavier University. Um, and I accepted it a little prematurely, I think, looking back at it, because I went to the indoor um, state track meet in high school, where there was a ton of college coaches there, like Ohio State, um, Eastern Michigan, a couple of D1 programs that after I competed there um, and placed second, they were all coming up to my sister, who they thought was my coach, and telling her, oh, like, we'd love to have her, you know, we'll talk more. And unfortunately, I'd already accepted my scholarship at that point, so I kind of just had to say no. Um, so I ended up going to Xavier where I competed for a year and just, I had a very poor experience. Um, we didn't have a long jump coach and I never got to practice like anything that I was used to practicing in high school with, with a bunch of specific um, event coaches that I had. Um, and I really also wanted to play volleyball again and at division one level, it's really hard to play two sports at the same time. And with having a scholarship in, a, in track, um, there's this NCAA hierarchy where track is kind of at the bottom, doesn't generate a lot of revenue for the NCAA. And at the top is like football, um, basketball, all the all the big sports. Um, so if you have a scholarship in one of those lower funnel sports and you try to move to one that's higher, they take away your scholarship. So Xavier was really gonna be unaffordable at that point if I lost my scholarship. Um, and Otterbein was somewhere that I was interested in going um, back in high school, but unfortunately it didn't work out money wise. Um, but going back and being a transfer student, um, somehow I got more of an academic scholarship that actually equaled my academic plus athletic scholarship at Xavier. So that's how I ended up at Otterbein. Um, I'm from Malvern, Ohio, which is a very small school um, up near Canton. And it's kind of hard to get looked at from a small school. And mostly in baseball, you get looked at through your summer leagues. And I guess I found, Ak well, Akron was the first uh, team to contact me and 
after all going through all that, uh, mostly Mac schools were interested in me. And mostly D2 and D3 schools and JUCOs were all interested too, but I was just like only focused on D1. Um, ended up, my brother went to Akron, and like it's only 40 minutes from my house, so I ended up choosing Akron in the, in the long run. And um, I have a little different story, I guess. I was kind of forced out in a sense. Um, I was the old coach's recruit, and the old coach got, I don't know if he got fired or like stepped down, he might have got forced to step down. Um, so he left, so I, well, I thought I'd be able to make the team, and which I thought I would have, and I should have. And um, the new coach came in and kind of just cleared, cleared out house, and kind of got well screwed in the end, where I had to drop divisions to play right away because you can't you know, transfer to another D1 without sitting out. Um, so I ended up dropping down to Division three, and I knew a uh, pro scout at the time that is for the Cubs that lives probably, I don't know. Dublin, how far is that? 20 minutes from here or something. He said, and baseball is kind of different to where you don't have to be from like a Division One school to get seen. So um, he said that if you're close to around here, then uh, you can still get seen. I'll be at the games or whatever and keep an eye out on you. And so he kind of pushed me towards this way. And I found out they needed a, a third baseman or shortstop. So I just kind of decided to come here. I guess you guys want to talk a little bit about initially coming to Otterbeiner your first year here or the difference you noticed right away from your previous school. I know Madison, you probably just talked about your freshman year as a whole. You don't really have much to compare it to. Um, but I guess initially, initial comparisons from where you were at to, to Otterbein and how that first year here went for you. Oh, you're yeah, whoever, whoever wants to. Sure. Uh, the biggest difference for me, um, because there are not scholarships, um, was it, it's just a different atmosphere. You know, you have people studying to be doctors and lawyers, and not that that doesn't happen in Division One, but it happens a lot more here, and people are paying their way um, to go to school here. So there's a lot more leniency, although Coach Powell and all of his coaching buddies might not make you think this, but there, there really is more of a leniency around um, attending other things besides practice, having to go to a class, having to study, get to a tutor. Um, so for me, it was just much less of a job being here, and I was able to enjoy a game that I'd always loved much more than when I was at Western Kentucky. Um, there was a, uh, you know, the coaches would always say school first and football second, but we would always say school first, football second. And that was kind of the running joke of the, the players because we never really believed them when they said it. So, you know, I would just say, you know, it, it was nice to be able to communicate to my, my coaches. Um, um, just that you know you are here to get an education first, and you don't have that in Division One, even though they might uh, they might say the otherwise. So that was the biggest difference for me. Um, well, my freshman year here, uh, uh, my coach Brandon Coons, he was all about education, and so D One's different. You have a tutor that travels with you. You are required to go to a certain study tables, and so D Three it was school first so if you have to miss class for practice you don't do that you you go to class and so it was just great that division three stressed so much education education because i'm not gonna be go pro and play soccer out of college it's just something i love something i want to do and yeah it's competitive but i can also get an education do what i want to do for the rest of my life um, I would totally agree that the atmosphere is a lot different. I had study tables that I had to go to at Xavier too, but they were not anything like study tables I imagine going into it. The guy who was in charge of ours was also on our track team, and I forget what sport it was. He was into some sport, and he would just play it on the, like, on there, the whole study tables, and people would chit chat and throw paper airplanes and whatever crazy stuff that I'm like, I really cannot focus whatsoever in here, and I would do much better being on my own. But you had to go to study tables. You better never miss practice or you're going to be in trouble. <laughs> um, and when I came here, it was very different. Of course, it's good to go to practice and 99.9% .9 of the time you do. But if something does come up where you have a really good opportunity to do something in your class, go somewhere, um, which I did my senior year. We went on some class trips that were just really, really good experiences I didn't want to miss out on. Monica McDonald, who's still the coach, she totally understood. Um, you can make practice up at a different time. She would meet with you 9 a.m., noon, whenever you were able to meet. She would meet with you and kind of have like a one-on-one -on -one session. Um, and same story with track for me. I had an internship um, at 10TV, and I barely ever was able to make it to track practice. I always did it on my own, either before or oftentimes after. Um, 
like it from like nine to 10, eight to 10, I would practice track totally on my own and they were totally understanding. And as long as they know you're gonna do this stuff on your own, they're totally cool with it. So definitely a different atmosphere here with academics being the primary focus. My biggest difference was walking to class, to be honest. <laughs> um, I had to go, I actually took a bike ride that was way further than what I usually do here. I mean, I still take a bike ride <laughs> in Audubon Small. But um, <laughs> other than that, um, probably a difference is um, I had decent sized classes at Akron and here it's a lot more smaller and I have a lot more personal like conversations and stuff with my professor. And um, I like that a lot better than the teachers don't even probably remember my name at Akron. So uh, I don't know, that's my probably. <laughs> No one's going to show up to practice for her now. <laughs> they have told us it was okay if we missed. <laughs> what, uh, I guess, what <laughs> challenges have you encountered as a Division three athlete that maybe you would have had a Division one, or um, what kind of things were you able to get involved in? Jack, I know I think at one point you were working like 40 hours a week while you were yep. quarterback of the team. Yeah, my last year at Otterbein, um, I was in grad school. I was working. I was, I was working for a beverage distributor. Um, I was waking up at about 6 o'clock, getting to work at 7. Work would be over at about three o'clock, and then I'd get to practice. Coach Loth actually moved practice back so that I could get there. Um, I had practice from maybe 4:30 to six, and then I had to be at my graduate class um, at 6:30 or whatever time that started. So I was working full time, going to school full time, and I also was getting—I was either married or getting married. Um, <laughs> So I was also living with a woman full time, which none of you quite understand yet. But it was, uh, it, but it was great. I mean, great. Uh, it was great that I was able to do that. You know, I absolutely wouldn't have been able to to do that um, at Western Kentucky when I was there. So um, right now, my biggest challenge is probably I have zero time to do anything. Um, so I go from classes. My major is BMB, so I'm a biochemistry and molecular biology. I want to be a dentist. And um, I go from class every week to therapy and then therapy to practice and practice to OCHEM and SI sessions. So I have zero time to do anything, any homework. Um, so that's probably my biggest challenge is making sure I <laughs> make time for your homework and studying and I have to I struggle through that, but. We actually push us back to 7.30 from 7 and I'd be mad at a test like that, so. Yeah. Hopefully Don't take okay. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I totally agree though. The biggest thing for me, especially doing two sports was I always had a sport to play, so. Um, but I also wanted to have the internship opportunities and that kind of stuff that I knew was important for after college. Um, so kind of like how I mentioned uh, last time around was my internship that I had at 10 TV um, that I was working like nine to six, three days a week. So that took up a big chunk of time in addition to taking a full class load and um, trying to make practice, which I never succeeded at. But as it sounds, I don't really have any too many challenges. <laughs> <laughs> I have Easy, baseball, right? I have baseball and I have classes and my professors are pretty lenient because I'm sport management, so they know like I'm gonna miss for sports, and I don't really have anything that overlaps too much. So I have my class dates, and my practice times, they never overlap. I'm good to go. <laughs> Sorry for wow. you guys. Yeah, you can play baseball. Sports Kristen, management. What is your major? We, we have a chemistry major, biochemistry major. Yeah, BMB. Uh, dental, dental school is ahead of you, and Jack is in business. Already has an MBA. I majored in communications, and I almost minored in Spanish, but I wanted to graduate a semester early, and I had one class left in my Spanish minor, so I just decided to nix it so I could graduate early instead of taking one Spanish class to finish it, so. Jack and Chris, I don't know if you guys want to talk a little bit about what you're doing now, um, or what you've done since, sure. since graduation. Um, I actually, to, so I was a religion undergrad. When I was at Western Kentucky, I went back and forth between business and um, PE and health. Uh, to be a, a coach and a teacher. Um, and then when I came back here, religion is just something that I've always loved. Um, and I thought I might want to be a religion teacher, but um, I also knew that there was an MBA program. So I wanted to get my undergraduate done kind of as fast as I could. Um, but I also wanted to study something that I loved. And if there's, you know, one of the pieces of advice I would walk away with is study something that you enjoy learning about, even if you're not really sure where that's going to lead. Um, you know, you're here and it's, you know, I don't know how many people in this room's parents are helping them get through school, 
and how many people are paying for it out of pocket versus loans. But I can assure you, if you were paying it out of pocket right now, you'd be studying something you enjoyed because you'd feel what it feels like to pay that much money for something. But because it doesn't always happen like that and how you pay for it, um, you just don't, you know, you kind of kind of breeze through it and say, well, I'm not really sure what I want to do. If there's something you enjoy learning about, just major in it and you'll enjoy the next four years much more otherwise. I actually remember an argument I had with Coach Powell about the existence of God. I don't think either of us won. <laughs> But, you know, so I was a religion undergrad and then, an, and then I got an MBA on top of it. And I'm in sales now. I'm sure you're, well, you might be familiar with Cisco, not the food company, but the IT company. So we resell routers and switches and servers. We build networks and voice over IP communication systems. Um, so being a religion undergrad, it really is the study of people and cultures. And as you look at how business is globalizing and just the United States in general, having that uh, background of understanding religions and cultures, especially with everything going on in the news right now, if you're um, aware of it, um, it's really came in handy. So, um, you know, that's kind of what I majored. Now, I would also say this on the topic of majors. Is there a computer science major or minor at Otterbein? I'm pretty sure there is. I would, I would tell all of you, at least minor in computer science. I don't care what you're going to go do if you think you're going to be a teacher, a nurse, what I would at least get a my if you're not getting a minor in computer science, I don't want to say you're wasting your money, but you're not getting the most of it. So um, I would definitely look into at least a minor in computer science. Um, so as Adam mentioned earlier, I graduated a semester early. So I graduated in December 2012, and two weeks later I started working. Um, at, it was then called Engage, but then we got bought out by a company called Moxie. Um, I worked in, it was an advertising agency, so I worked in the media department, um, buying ads. We had, some of our clients were like Donato's Pizza, Bob Evans, Moe's Southwest Grill, some of the stuff like that. It really wasn't for me, and if you are an athlete, it's really challenging to go from being an athlete to working at a desk job. It was really awful. Um, I just wasn't used to sitting down so often, but um, I quit working there in April because I actually just moved to Austin, Texas. Um, and I haven't gotten a job there yet because I'm actually back in Ohio for a month, so I knew no one was going to give me like four weeks vacation. But I have no idea what I'm going to end up doing um, ultimately. I'm looking at some sales things, maybe being a graduate assistant somewhere, um, getting my master's and maybe like curriculum and instruction and being an academic advisor at a college or something. Um, so lately what I've been doing a lot of is working out of CrossFit and stuff like I was telling Dr. Gorman earlier. So. We're going to see you on the CrossFit games sooner rather than later. Yeah, I'm trying to become a professional athlete, professional worker outer. <laughs> Do you want to open up for questions, JG? That's about all I got. Yeah. Question? Joe, <clears throat> how has playing a sport on Division Three like helped you later in life, like in the job market? People definitely like to hire people who have been athletes because you've learned leadership, teamwork, discipline, time management. You learn a ton of skills being an athlete that really look good on your resume. That's a, oh, go ahead, sorry. Try, how was your time management, like was it difficult to adjust your schedule? You had time or a little time? Like when you start working? No, like in college with sports and everything. Mm. I never really knew anything differently, speaking on my own behalf. I never really knew anything different, like being a three-sport athlete in high school, then going to doing two sports in college. It kind of felt the same way. And I didn't feel like I had any more work or practice took longer or anything like that. So it kind of was the same. Wait, what was the question? <laughs> how, did you, how, did you like, how was your time management with your homework and your classes and your practice? Well, like, you have to schedule your classes around practice. Um, usually the coaches pick out a section of time where it practices. So ours is from 4.15 to 5.45. And so you try to schedule your classes around. Obviously not all your classes are going to be outside of that time, but usually you try to schedule around it. I would say um, don't study when you're tired if you can help it. I know that sounds like a like all easy thing to think about, but you know, a lot of times you don't, if you have 30 minutes of study you need to do or an hour or two hours, a lot of times you leave it till the end of the day and then you're too tired, you're hungry, all you want to do is go to bed. So if you can knock it out sometime during the day, it, it just, it, it helps so much. And I didn't learn that until I had a year 
from when I was playing at Western Kentucky until I was playing here, and I had a year where I wasn't playing a sport um, other than intramurals, and I realized how much easier it was for me to study when I just wasn't dog tired. So if you can help it, try to study when you're not tired. And when you have free time, study, do homework. Whenever you have time, do it, because you may not have any other time after that. And take advantage of the bus rides, for oh, sure. yeah, for sure. <laughs> I did a lot of homework and studying on bus rides. I would, I'd say the other thing you have to kind of try to do is find out how you learn. So for instance, my now wife, I remember when uh, she was in college, she, she somehow miraculously found out that if she read something out loud that she would remember it. Okay, so I have horrible visions of I'm sitting there trying to watch a football game and she's reciting her science book out loud to nobody. And seriously, she would ace tests the next day. All she had to do was read it one time out loud. So there's creative ways to learn and study, but you have to find out what works the best for you. I have to write things out on a piece of paper. I, won't, I, I have to listen in class, take notes. I don't know if this happens to anyone else. I could sit in class, I'm taking notes, I go home, I look at the notes and I don't even remember writing them. I mean, literally, it's as if I don't even remember somebody saying it. But if I then sort of rewrote my notes, I would, rem I would remember um, that they had talked about it. So I know that all sounds kind of weird, but you just have to find out how you study and how you learn. Also, they have SI sessions for some classes. You have math lab. So like if you ever need help or you need extra <coughs> help in the class, like usually you have a TA that'll teach a SI session for more information. Uh, if y'all could do things differently, um, for you guys have already graduated, but if you could do things differently throughout college, looking back, what would you guys have done? I might have just played basketball too while I was at it. <laughs> Seriously. Um, I don't know, maybe. There's still time. Yeah. There is still time. Lots of years of eligibility of that, a couple in <laughs> track. Um, I might have double majored in like health promotion, fitness, and communication just because I also like that a lot. But there's really not a whole lot I would change. I don't really regret anything about my college experience so much. Um, I was not a great student. Um, I mean, I got. I would say I was a, a B minus student at best. Um, I, I really wish I could retake every class. I mean, I wish so badly right now that I could go back and retake the classes that I didn't pay attention in. But I will say you're learn even if you don't think you're learning, you are. Um, but that's, I mean, I hate to say it, but that's one thing I wish I would have just paid attention more in some of the classes. Um, the other thing I wish I would have done is, um, I guess the best way to say it is you don't have to read every word. So whether it's a, a reading assignment uh, for a novel or the science uh, chapter three on whatever it is. You know, I, I just, I used to get so overwhelmed with just not thinking I could remember it all or that I couldn't cover all the material or I didn't read fast enough. So I, you know, I only had 30 minutes, but I knew it would take me two hours. You know, it's okay to not read every word. You know, you can, it's amazing how much you can remember from just reading the first sentence and the last sentence of a paragraph. I mean, it's just, it's amazing how much, and you'll actually start to learn that most of the important things are in, you know, the first sentence and the last sentence of paragraphs. It's how the structure is. So I guess my, my advice is, you know, you can still get through the reading material and the assignments. You don't have to read every single word. You don't have to try to remember everything, but if you can understand the concepts, you can get through the courses, and those are actually what you'll end up remembering in five and ten years are the concepts that you learn as opposed to you know a vocabulary list i took spanish five times and i took cpr five times <laughs> and if there was you know a mexican standing there choking i couldn't help him at all i couldn't talk to him and i couldn't resuscitate him. <laughs> <laughs> I, Sorry, that might have been that might not have been politically correct, so I apologize if that didn't come out right, but I think you get the point. But I'm saying, you know, I wish you know, and now I have a one you know on a serious note, I have a one year old and a three year old. You know, and I was talking to my wife a week ago, I said, you know, we should really brush up on our CPR. So you know, anyways. Well, maybe you don't uh 
not a religion teacher, but you are a teacher. I mean, are you are you hearing the academic advice he's giving you? I mean, what an academic coach! This, this is great. Uh, let me let me turn this. Up. Let me ask a question about money. And some of you who were in class the other day know that that's part of what I want to uh, teach in this lesson. But do, do do you guys? I mean, you went to or you did not go to the Division One school where you were getting a scholarship. Uh, or not a scholarship. Do you, do you resent that you played sports for so long for a school that did not pay you? Uh, or that you, in order to continue playing your sport, you had to continue it at such an expensive school? Uh, how, what are your feelings about money? I know Jack has talked about working full time uh, while in school. Uh, would I have liked to get paid? Yes, absolutely. Um, my scholarship at Xavier was kind of different. It worked on like a, they, Xavier was different because they started their track program, I think in like 2006, and I started there in 2009. So obviously most people know Xavier is a basketball school. So basically if you didn't play basketball, like you were just brushed under the rug. They didn't care anything about you. They had three scholarships to give out between men's and women's track and field and cross country. Wow. So that's like, 60 to 80 people that 95% of them didn't have scholarship money. So I felt very blessed. They would they split up the money. So no one was a full scholarship athlete, but they split up the money. I think there was maybe like 10 scholarship athletes. Um, mine was broken up on a 4, 6, 8, 12 basis. So my first year I had athletic or academic plus the $4,000. And what I got at Otterbein equaled that. Now. If I would have continued at Xavier, obviously my scholarship would have increased, so I would have ended up paying less money in the long run, but I wouldn't trade my experience at Otterbein nor the loan that I'm paying back now for anything. I know it's going to take a while, but it was totally worth it. <laughs> um, I feel bad for my parents <laughs> because I came to Otterbein. Um, I could have basically gone to Moorhead for free, but I mean, it, I guess it just depends on the person. Like your maybe your parents are paying for college, but it like for my parents it's morals. It's a long story, but I wouldn't change it for anything. They get to come to every game. They get to see me grow up, and you know my brother's only an hour and a half away from them too, and so they still get to experience and live through us in college because they're because I'm closer and smaller, and I actually get to play. <laughs> Um, I would say just don't waste the education. Um, you know, I have a one-year-old and a three-year-old, as I said, and you know, now understanding what it is, I mean, you'll you'll pay a lot of money to make your kids happy. Um, but uh, you know, I have now looking back, I realize why my parents spent the money that they did on my education. Um, and uh, but but I also realize that it is for the education. I mean, it really is. Um, you're learning more now than you think you are, I can guarantee it. So just try to pay attention as much as you can. Sean, do you have something to add to that? By the way, I hope I didn't offend anyone with my comments. <laughs> I'm replaying it back in my head. Quentin. Uh, do you guys feel that um, sports held you back from the education part? No. Mm -mm. No way. Not at all. I would say... Um, <laughs> From an academic sense, there were times that I think it did, but the education that it gave me in other areas, it was a trade-off. You know, it's a trade-off. And it goes back to the just, when you're tired, it's hard to study, you know? I'm sure if I wouldn't have been doing two-hour practices every day in the fall, I might have had a little bit of a higher GPA, but to me, the trade-off of what I was gaining by being involved in a team, you're, you're getting an education, but not necessarily from the, the ac academic sense. And you can get that with all types of extracurricular activities. I mean, it doesn't have to be sports. I mean, there's a lot of activities that you can do here. You just have to understand how to balance that. What is worth the time? What are you giving up? Um, so. Do you guys have any stories or at least of friends that you played with at Division One or that you know are at Division One that <coughs> have since told you they wish they would have played Division Three or, you know, kids that went to Division One and never played? And Anything of that nature? I have a friend, she, first semester, she's a pre-med student, ran track at Ohio State. And she quit because basically playing an extra sport did nothing for her major. It 
Uh, it's on her resume and it doesn't really, they don't see it differently. Um, it was a job, so she didn't have enough time to study. She had to go lift at 6 a.m., so she had to go to bed early. That means she couldn't be up late studying. So just, it was too much for her. It was basically a job and she never really got to school-wise. She had to take classes at different times, like she had to wait a semester to take chemistry because she couldn't take it during track season and cross-country season, so it's a mess for her. So she now she plays club soccer at Ohio State, and it's not a job. It's three <laughs> days a week, and sometimes you travel, sometimes you don't, so it's a big difference for her. Other questions? I guess Kristen said one thing there that uh, we, we don't think of uh, Division three athletes, uh, certainly they're not paid while they're in school, but we don't think of many of them going out as professionals in their sports. But Kristen mentioned the, the CrossFit, that through you know her athleticism, she may make some money, quite a bit of money, she hopes. But she also <laughs> mentioned something else. There's an awful lot of uh, student athletes who go to graduate school as GAs graduate assistants uh, as uh, football coaches, basketball coaches, track coaches, baseball coaches, or whatever. That's, we have, what, 25 or 30 of them here at Otterbein. There's another 25 or 30 at just about every small college in Ohio, but there are 50 and 60 and 100 at the larger universities. So it's not playing for the Boston Red Sox, say, but it's uh, a way of continuing as a, as a uh, coach in your, in your field. Uh, we have one right here uh, who is a GA. What, in your third year, coach? Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. So that's a, a way of suddenly at 22 or 23, turning your sport into something that can pay you back a little bit. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Joe. Um, for, for the three of you that went D1 first and then transferred back, would you? Like, would you have rather just went to Division Three to begin with, now with the experience you had, or do you still like like the idea that you did play Division One sports? I think the Division One thing was talked up a lot more, and that was partially the reason I accepted the scholarship in the first place. I remember being in some high school um, meeting for athletes, and it was like one one or two percent of high school athletes ever go to BD One, and so they made it like you really want to strive for it. If you're not a Division One athlete, like then you're not really that big of a deal. But looking back, I for sure would have just come here to start with. Like, I don't even oftentimes tell people that I ever even went to Xavier, so no one even really knows that. So for sure I would have started here. I think I would have had a better experience overall. But then also, in the same token, it made me appreciate being here more because I had something to compare it to that was not as great as the experience I had here. So I, I would have still started here, though, initially. I feel bad because my coach is here, but <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I think I would have definitely still went D1 um, out of high school. I think that was all I was really focused on, and I don't know, I enjoyed my time going to D1, and but to be honest, I think everything happens for a reason, and I'm completely satisfied with where I am right now, and if I wasn't here, I don't know if I'd be like the prospect that I am right now to have a potential chance to go to the next level and be drafted. So I've had a lot of opportunities here that my coaches have made for me um, that I'm very thankful for. Um, I think I would have probably um, just looked at a lot more schools in the recruiting process. Um, you know, I guess when you're in the recruiting process, you think it's either Otterbein or Ohio State, right, or, or Akron or wherever that is. But there's, there's a lot of Division II schools. There's a lot of 1AA schools that you're just not familiar with. Or because they don't send you letters, you don't look them up. So um, I don't know if there's any people in here that are not yet out of college and are in the recruiting process. But I think that's the advice I would give is just make sure you look at the entire landscape. So I'm not saying I wouldn't have gone to Western Kentucky, but um, I would have just to have liked to look at a lot more schools than I did. Because I think I just looked at the ones that gave me scholarship offers. But there's a lot of schools that you could call and say, hey, I want to go to your school they might offer you a scholarship. And that goes for academics as well, um, not just in athletics. I would add one thing that Kristen said. A lot of people fall in love with Division One or the limelight of Division One, and think that you can't get attention, you can't get the limelight of Division Three. Not that that's the most important, but Jack, I think, was probably everywhere that year we went to the playoffs. And 
you know, really got recognized for what he did. And, you know, Jack and Chris, when I've seen them getting interviewed on the field, or I've had to set up interviews for them just like I would for a Division One athlete, or I'm getting calls from, from local reporters wanting to interview them just like Braxton Miller does at Ohio State. I think Sean's on the brink of that, and I think Madison's got some time to, to do that as well. So I don't think that just because you, you're at the Division Three doesn't mean you don't get the same limelight. It's just maybe a different, different limelight. I would add to that, too, and I'll take that a little bit of a different direction, but back to where we were earlier. You know, along those lines, is that whole idea of the scholarship being so alluring. And, uh, you know, certainly it is for, for all the right reasons, because it is, it is money. It is money for your education and whatnot. But as a former student athlete here at Otterbein, someone who has paid off for loans, and, and, uh, and, you know, my parents helped put me through school, but I, I very much remember that conversation in, in the car ride back after I visited this campus about the whole question of affordability and the whole question of um, not having an opportunity for an athletic scholarship here where maybe I would have somewhere else. And what was that gonna mean for our family and for my decision and my financial situation later on? And the one thing I can say with absolute certainty is that I would make that decision all over again. And my parents, if they were here in this room, would tell you that it was the absolute best decision for me. So for those of you that are student athletes, it's the same conversation that I have with your parents when they're sitting in my orientation session, which is my goal is to make sure that you all have the experience where you can look me in the eye and they can look me in the eye at the end of your time and say, I would do this all over again. No matter the cost, no matter the sacrifice, we got our return on investment. We had a great experience. The education was fantastic. I would make this decision all over again. So there's that idea of the scholarship that once again is so alluring but it's the experience that really, really counts in terms of what you're, what you're getting, what you're doing. So. Yeah, and, and, and I think as Kristen has said, we have, when we look at Division I, we think, wow, everything is paid for. And now, if you follow the news uh, about the way in which Division Three is breaking up, uh, perhaps, uh, we see that a lot of things aren't paid for. And as Madison is telling us about her friend at OSU, you, you feel like a, uh, a widget there. You feel like uh, someone in, in a factory uh, every moment of your time, whereas this is a little bit more, uh, uh, I, I think, uh, you have some room to make uh, your four years your own. Uh, let's just walk, run down through these ideas uh, right here. Uh, we've, we've seen from Kristen uh, on the sheet behind you guys, sorry you can't see that, uh, uh, but it's ideas that you've all covered uh, so well tonight. Multi-sports athletes. Um, I don't know if there's anyone in the room uh, who is uh, a multi-sport athlete or sees, sees himself as that. But we have them here at Otterbein. We have we have players. In fact, probably the most. We we have 92. What? Run, yeah, running cross country and track. Yeah. And, yeah, yeah, and and certainly the most famous um, um, athlete in Otterbein history. Jeff Gibbs. Jeff Gibbs. Jeff Gibbs. I'm blanking on his name. Jeff Gibbs was a football player and a basketball player. He was the basketball player that helped us win the uh, NCAA title. Um, but so multi-sports athletes, uh, D3 athletes have an off-season. Off Still, you have an off-season. It's starting to be encroached upon, right? Every every team <coughs> there is a, a non-traditional season in in, uh, in all sports now. Your teams get together formally in the off season. You run through some practices that last for about a, what almost a month or so, and and there's expectations that you lift, and, and but of course you would want to, but there's not the the kind of uh, drudgery 365 days a year that you would find uh, at, as a Division One. D3 eligibility standards minimize conflicts between athletics and academics. They're still there. Uh, but I think a couple of people have, uh, Madison mentioned that, you know, a student had to wait a year to take the chemistry class. There's really less flexibility elsewhere. There's, there's much flexibility as we possibly can, can uh, work into the system here. There are, in fact, have any of you, uh, do any of you have, how many of you have had problems with uh, practice time running into a class or what, uh, uh, having to leave early to go to a game Right, there, there are only 24 hours. You know, you, you have to both uh, prize your time and also give your time to the sport. But still, there's really, I think everybody here, the faculty as well as 
the coaches are trying to make the system work for you. Um, balanced lifestyle of involvement. <coughs> How many of you have uh, had uh, feelings that you might uh, pledge a sorority or fraternity? Uh, you know, that's a possibility if you're an athlete. Whereas I think in <laughs> Division One, probably not many athletes do, but uh, I think maybe more, more, uh, more guys are in fraternities uh, than, uh, okay. Uh, let's see. Regional in-season and conference competition. Yeah, I think there's a real effort to develop uh, games. You know, we play in the Ohio Athletic Conference for a reason, so that you know you can play a real conference game at Capitol or an hour away at Muskingum or two hours away at Mount Union. Uh, we do try to get some um, off, you know, especially at the beginning of the season or in NCAA play, some out of the region. You know, that's kind of fun going to Chicago to play uh, soccer uh, or uh, to Florida for spring break or whatever. Uh, D3 athletic departments are dedicated to foster the best student athlete experience. I think that's what I see. I see we have, what, 20 full time coaches uh, and uh, a staff of about another 40 part-time people who are really busting to make the best possible experience for you. They really do think with your um, welfare in mind. Uh, and then lastly, D3 athletics offer high-level competition where student athletes play first for the love of the game rather than for the athletic scholarship. Yeah, uh, you do, you do. It's, Especially in football, you play the best, uh, right? Did you play? You, put, you probably played against half a dozen uh, NFL players uh, in your experience time. You know, Mountain Union players and uh, a couple of other teams have sent players to the NFL. So you're playing against the best. 